At the very moment when John was tickling his lips with crummy, shining tresses, the queer object of the girl's unfortunate craving was having a prolonged and distressing argument with his father on the subject of Nell. I tell you, if only it only torments the woman the way you treat her, better never see her at all than sneak off over there every day he's away. The museum actually echoed to the indignant tone of the vicar, and the lid of his tobacco jar that stood adjacent to the aquarium tinkled ominously against the glass. But she's gone um, seven months with our child father, and since the end of August, he's been at Wookiee nearly all the time. But Mrs. Pippard with her, boy. You found Mrs. Pippard with her yourself. She's fond of her, isn't she? But, Father, when a woman's going to have a child, she's nervous and sensitive anyway. And when it's your own child, she's going to have... The vicar, vicar's rugged face had become very red in his formidable little eyes, like Sam's, only much grayer, had ceased to be gray and had become a curious blue color under his bushy eyebrows. He rose from his chair and stood with his broad shoulders to the mantelpiece, angrily jerking up the tails of his long black coat and holding his hands beneath them while he warmed his back at the fire. It's all wrong, he shouted. The whole thing's outrageous. If you'd had the spunk of half a man in you, you'd have made him divorce her. You'd have... He suddenly remembered that divorce was one of the things against which the party in the church to which he belonged was especially opposed. Well, anyway, he added, you'd have done one thing or the other, not gone about dickering and havering and dodging in the way you have. Sam was silent for a second or two. His face did not show the faintest trace of any resentment against his father. Then he suddenly said, Would you like her to leave Zoyland, father? Would you like her to come and live with us here? His father's mouth opened with astonishment, and he stared blankly. And be divorced, you mean? And you marry her, you mean? No, no, just live here with us. I'm not going to marry her, nor any other woman. Just live with us here, I mean. As your mistress, after the child is born, father. Well, isn't that what you mean? But perhaps you don't want to wait until the child is born. Perhaps you'd like to sleep with her, as she is under my roof. If Sam had been endowed with a little more penetration, he would have understood better what a surge of suppressed feeling underlay his father's outburst. As it was, he could only sigh helplessly and cast his eyes upon the aquarium. Often and often had the sight of those fish, disturbed by the lamplight and behaving in a manner contrary to their ordinary routine, distracted his mind from weightier troubles. He got up now and placed over them the kitchen dishcloth, which, in the th agitation of that night, both he and his father had forgotten. I suppose she'll be going into the hospital, he said as he sat down again, in another month. His father let his coattails drop and began striding up and down the room. I can't understand that fellow, Zoyland, he flung out, any better than I can understand you, that sweet little woman between you two rogues. Yes, that's the word for it, between you two rogues. He glared at Sam out of eye sockets that seemed like two deep, livid blue holes in a rock of red clay. Hmm, that's rather nice, isn't it? Sam surveyed him helplessly, not shrinking from his gaze, but looking at him as he would have looked at Whirl Hill if it had suddenly become a volcano. His father's wrath was beginning to affect him like a wild dream out of which he felt he ought to be able to force himself to awake. What would you wish me to do, father, if I did exactly what you would please you? 
Please me, does he say? Were the exasperated man. I tell you, I hate the whole affair. And I have a mind to, mind to wash my hands of it. It was on his tongue to say, my hands of you. But he corrected himself in time. What would you, would you tell me to do, Father, if I did exactly what you told me? This point-blank question did quite quiet the angry man a little. He put his hands into his trouser pockets and walked with a somewhat less assured stride. Sam had nonplussed him a bit by this question. It was much easier to storm and rage at his son than to give him intelligent advice. But he satisfied both his anger and his conscience when he finally came out with his reply. I think if you haven't the guts to act like a man in the matter, you ought to leave this girl alone. This was probably the wickedest thing Matt Dicker had ever done in his life, the utterances of this opinion. Sam's strange fixed idea of sharing in Christ's sacrifice might quite conceivably have put it into his head that it was his duty to do exactly as his father bade him, in which case Nell would have had the experience of losing her headstrong lover at the precise moment when the sort of companionship he felt allowed to give her was exactly the comfort which she craved most of to receive, which it was indeed all she could receive. But Sam was not yet a complete maniac, nor was had his father's constant harping upon the string of being a man and having guts failed altogether to arouse a natural reaction. He rose firmly to his feet. Well, father, he said, if that's all that help you can give me, I think we'd better bring this conversation to a close. He paused for a moment and then, ashamed at the abruptness of his tone, he added more gently, You've always been good to me, father. This is the first time in my life that I've troubled you like this. I dare say we'll both of us see things more calmly, more more quietly later on. He took a few steps towards the door and then stopped and turned. It had always been his their custom, a custom rather unusual among sons and fathers in Gladstonbury, perhaps one that was an emotional legacy left to the atmosphere of the house of Sam's Swiss mother, to kiss each other good night. On this occasion, it needed one of the greatest spiritual efforts he had ever undertaken when Sam forced himself to go up to his father and make the motion of offering to kiss him. A red-faced, righteously indignant, dignified, and outraged man... Let me repeat that because it's kind of a ridiculous statement. A red-faced, righteously indignant, dignified, and outraged man is not an easy objective for such an advance as Sam now made. But the power of habit is great. And Matt Decker, after all, loved nobody in the world, certainly not this girl whose troubling beauty had so upset him as much as he loved his son. So now, though in deep and gloomy gravity, he did bent his head and allow his rough, bristly cheek, for he was a man who needed shaving twice a day, to touch, for the tenth part of a second, Sam's upraised and twitched chin. Good night, Father. Good night, my boy. Sam's betaking himself to his bedroom that night coincided, after about five minutes leeway, with the departure to bed of another Glatzenbury bachelor, namely... Mr. Thomas Barter. The steps up which this gentleman slowly and wearily climbed were much less pleasant to extend than those dusted and polished by penny pitches. Mr. Barter was no longer in his high street room. Since his salary at the municipal, as he was called, was based on the success of the venture against under his management and as his task in organizing it was a Herculean one, he found himself for the moment with a very meager income. He had been forced to economize if he were to be able to continue his daily table de hots at the Pilgrims's. And not to continue this meant the last straw of misery. His adventure with Lily had turned out anything but a success. This dreamy, romantic maiden had unexpectedly proven herself a past mistress in the art of giving nothing for nothing. 
has such kissing as he likes, where this auspices ruins, an entrance fee, every night, every time, for Lily refused to steal into the grounds over the Abbey House wall, hid such chaste delinquencies. But beyond kissing, absolutely not one single swollen, stolen sweet. Not swollen, stolen. Thus, for the last month, for he had long ago quarreled with the mercenary Clarissa, Mr. Barter had been compelled to be chaste. His sole pleasure during this epic had been the tender but rather anxious one of snatching difficult assignations with tossy stickles. In default of all other feminine society, for Mary seems, since her marriage, deliberately to avoid seeing him alone, Mr. Barter clung quite pathetically to his interview with his ruined toss. Her sweetness to him knew no bounds. With her, if they could only manage to escape observation, everything was permitted, nothing was forbidden, and all was for pure love. He got fonder and fonder of Tossie. Her ways, in her state of pregnancy, astonished him by their sweetness and quaintness. He even became interested in this for the first time in his masterful career, in his future progeny. progeny. Mary were the whimsical colloquies, interspersed with bursts of imperious, impious merriment that they had together. Oh, I'm sorry. Many. Many were the whimsical colloquies, interspersed with bursts of impious merriment that they had together over this serious event. The girl had recently got into her head, so big had her belly grown, and so violent were the moments, within, movements within her, that they were destined to be the parents of twins. And even this prospect, conceivably one of humorous horror to an unscrupulous Don Juan, appeared to be by no means distasteful to Mr. Barter. But dear to him, as were these happy encounters, they had been become so infrequent of late as the girl's time drew nearer that they no longer served to remove the gloom which kept gathering deeper and deeper upon him. Tonight, as he mounted those disgusting stairs in George Street, after a long, wretched evening spent in his miserable little restaurant, he really felt as if he were reproaching, uh, approaching, the end of his tether. When he had turned on the gas jet, the burner had not even got a globe, he sat down on his chilly bed and surveyed his washing basin and heavy white jug with a nauseated resentment that couldn't see nothing in front of him but a leaden urinal wall of blank despair. God, he thought, this won't do. I'll be cracked in this goes on. I must get hold of a new girl. But the worst of it was, whenever he tried to think of a new girl, and he knew quite a lot of them, while it's alone, had at least half a dozen, and only one of those was impossible, he always thought of Toss. What was it about Toss that caught him so? It must be the way she laughed. She laughed with such rich, rich merriment. She went off at anything he'd say or do, and nothing could stop her. He'd never known a girl before who laughed with such a bubbling chuckle, and then such a ringing per peals. And she used to laugh like that when he was making love to her. God, she would laugh sometimes when, really, a girl ought to be grave. But he didn't care. He liked her to laugh. Her laugh was like all the curves of her plump body. Well, well, she won't laugh, poor little thing when her time comes. But perhaps she will. Perhaps her child will be born into one prolonged rich peal of laughter. Her child? Her twins! A boy and a girl, a toss and a tom. Yes, her laugh was like her arms between her shoulders and elbows. The inside of them when she bent them. Her laugh was like those rings about her ear, her knees, made by those ridiculous garters. A new girl? Damn them all! Thin, sour, puritanical, avaricious, cold-blooded hussies. Well, 
Seems like Tom Barter's in love. I do like a girl who laughs. It's myself, too. Anyway, that's uh, Gladstone Berry Romance for today. We'll see you next time. Cheers.